things that we can see every day and uh, in um, any place. Uh, actually, these are uh, scenes filled with uh, many, many objects uh, at one time. Um, and we also know from um, the whole history of psychology uh, and also from our everyday perception that um, our capacity to deeply process objects is very limited. Uh, it means that uh, we can attend uh, to just a handful of uh, objects, maybe two or three at a time, and we are able to store no more than probably up to four of them in our uh, working memory. Uh, so our capability of doing deep processing uh, of objects is uh, really, really very limited. If you are familiar with uh, things like change blindness or inattentional blindness, uh, this uh, invisible gorilla uh, stuff, very popular term, uh, then you probably know that uh, if you're uh, if you're looking directly to an object, but your attention is not at, uh, at the object, um, you fail to notice it, uh, even if it is a very big object or a very big event uh, occurring to that object. So, very limited capacity. But, uh, at the same time, uh, at every moment of our perception, we're definitely aware of much more than just a handful of objects, uh, not just two, not three, but a uh, big number of objects. Uh, like here, uh, you definitely see a lot of uh, birds, not only three at a time. Uh, you see a crowd of birds and uh, you can uh, say immediately uh, that where, uh, in, in which direction they are flying, or uh, where these cars are uh, going and uh, probably if they moved you would be able to say their average speed uh, and you see a lot of people so uh, you definitely see, um, uh, see multiple objects and you are uh, uh, definitely know much more about all of objects than uh, about just uh, a few objects uh, at a time and uh, now let me show you uh, how efficient you can be uh, doing this task, uh, knowing uh, a lot of things about uh, all objects uh, together. Uh, it, it will be a sort of uh, uh, demo replication from the very famous experiment by uh, Dan Ariely, um, uh, which actually uh, founded the whole field of um, ensemble perception studies. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is to show you a set of uh, objects, of just circles, white circles uh, with different diameters. Uh, and then I uh, immediately remove them and show you just a single object, uh, just a single circle with a single diameter. Uh, and I'll ask you to say whether it is uh, greater or smaller than the mean diameter or the mean size of uh, all uh, circles uh, that I uh, I'm going to briefly show you. Ready? Is it greater or smaller than the mean? Uh, it is rather greater, and it is the correct answer. Now. Yeah, it is. It is smaller, uh, and uh, you are uh, pretty confident about this. Uh, maybe if I uh, if I show you the exact mean size, uh, you uh, would, uh, would be divided 50-50. Uh, uh, so, um, but anyway, it is uh, quite an easy task, but uh, if uh, I ask you a slightly different question, if I ask you to say whether uh, you remember seeing exactly that object uh, in, in uh, this, uh, the previous display, uh, your uh, answer will be a rather guess. 
and um, uh, in fact you know very little about uh, concrete objects when you're exposed to them uh, for just uh, half a second or so. Uh, and we definitely need to attend object by object to know uh, much about these particular objects. But we know uh, a lot about, uh, about uh, all of these objects at once. Uh, so this is what we call ensemble summary statistics. Uh, so this is a picture from um, a very famous review by George Alvarez um, saying, uh, well, it, it shows how it might work. Uh, so when you have um, a lot of items with different features, feature values, um, when you are not attending to them, uh, the representation of each individual item uh, is quite noisy. Uh, because your uh, processing of them is very uh, superficial and, um, um, and so with any additional item uh, they become noisier and noisier. Uh, in order to see them correctly you need uh, limited capacity of your attention but it is limited so you cannot see all of them uh, precisely uh, at one time. But instead of that, uh, you can represent the summary of all these objects at higher level somewhere. Uh, that, um, because these are noisy and uh, you uh, commit errors, and these errors are not systematic. Uh, some representations are slightly overestimated, some are slightly underestimated. Uh, and these are not correlated, uh, then mm, when you average between them due to uncorrelatedness, your mean is not, not super biased and uh, it can become a more precise estimate of, uh, of the whole uh, set uh, than each individual representative. So it is precise. It is also economic because uh, you just use one description uh, for uh, the whole set instead of uh, many, many descriptions for uh, individuals. And uh, we also say that it is abstract uh, because you actually have no idea uh, which object uh, was where, uh, especially if it is presented very briefly. So now, of course, you know that uh, the small one is here and the uh, big one is here, but you can attend to them. Uh, when it is very short and uh, there are many objects, you, uh, you don't know uh, about their spatial location, but you know the average. Uh, it is not only about size. Uh, uh, the same ability to average uh, to do it very precisely was found in many, many uh, visual domains. Uh, low level, relatively low level, like uh, so just some basic uh, properties of objects like size, orientation, or color, uh, but it is also found for more complex uh, objects and more complex property like facial expression. Uh, so people can judge uh, the average uh, emotional expression of the crowd of faces. Um, and uh, this is a beautiful recent work showing that uh, you're able to do uh, uh, this for even more abstract uh, and high level property like animacy. So if I mix uh, animate objects with uh, non-animate objects uh, in some proportion, uh, you can somehow adjust the average animacy or as they call it, white likeness. Um, so um, it's quite interesting. Um, and it, it is also related to uh, uh, good old issues like perceptual organization. Uh, so here uh, it is, uh, so you can see here uh, two uh, definitely different textures uh, that are just uh, um, 
provided by the mean differences between sizes uh, on the left and on the right, and you definitely see these very well organized groups uh, and uh, uh, the mean size as well as the sing and the single size is a good uh, sample for uh, testing the difference between these two uh, halves of, uh, of the display. And here you can also see that there are probably two different textures uh, and you can see a sort of a gradient uh, and you see that uh, on the left uh, the sizes are uh, greater on average uh, and you see it, uh, uh, you, you don't compare uh, circle by circle, uh, you see them as holes, but the organization of it uh, is much poorer, uh, and it is because uh, the mean to variance ratio uh, as sizes are more varying here and more varying here than in the previous slide. Uh, you see this, uh, and they are also spatially not very well organized. Uh, you see some difference, but it is not that uh, evident as in the previous slide. So this uh, mean to variance ratio is important for uh, our main topic. Uh, so it means that, mm, uh, uh, in fact, uh, the greater the variance, uh, the less precise your estimate of the main uh, of the mean uh, is, and uh, so uh, it looks like that when we use a lot of dissimilar objects, uh, then perceptual organization uh, becomes well, it, it degrades. Uh, so somehow uh, these properties like mean and variance are related to. Um, um, to perceptual organization, uh, to your ability uh, to group items or maybe segment items uh, as representing different uh, sets for different characters. Uh, so now I'm going to, um, um, to the main point of this talk. Um, and let me start with a quick demonstration. Well, um, I think that some of you um, could see my uh, Facebook post or contact post with, um, with some examples of uh, real uh, real scenes uh, involving uh, uh, actually these are the same examples that I'm going to show now but uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that uh, I'm suggesting you to, to try to recognize um, two scenes that I'm going to show you. Um, so uh, let's do the first one. Uh, I'll show it just quickly and then I'll ask you to say uh, what you have seen. Okay, what was that? Leaves. 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 Okay. Uh, what can you say about these leaves? Awesome. Yeah, th they're probably. Uh, uh, in autumn, well, why do you know? They are all because they, color. Yeah, because of color. Uh, yeah, and uh, because so. they are on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, the same layer. Uh, well, yeah, they are. Ah, so you mean that they are fallen? Yeah, they are probably not on on a tree. Uh, okay, uh, next. What was that? Lemons. Lemons, what else? Lemons. And leaves, again. Uh, so somehow you know that uh, there were leaves on the first picture and there are at least two classes of objects on, on the second one, uh, lemons and leaves. Uh, and again, how do you know? Uh, how do you know that there, are, that there were you know, one class of objects on the first and two classes on the second? Um, the idea for that, for first stated in uh, my purely theoretical paper uh, about this three years ago in, in the Journal of Vision. Um, so uh, the idea for that uh, was that you can uh, use this ensemble summary statistics to judge whether uh, objects are uh, from the same category of the same type or from different types. Um, 
And uh, if, um, if I show you the distributions of uh, some basic properties, uh, like say, color, physical distributions, uh, you can see clear difference. Uh, first of all, it is uh, the difference in shapes. Uh, here you can see, uh, well, uh, you can see that in terms of the range, they are quite similar. Maybe this one a little bit more uh, broad range, but just a little bit. Um, but uh, the more important property uh, is that this one resembles um, a good old Gaussian, so something single peak, uh, and uh, actually the mean, uh, which is also the median, uh, it, it uh, looks like to be a good description for all this set. Whereas uh, on the second picture you see definitely a, a two-peak distribution. Uh, and uh, the mean, if I uh, put it here, uh, you can see that it is not uh, the best descriptor because it is uh, the most absent value. Um, yes, it is. Uh, so this sort, this sort of uh, bumpy distribution uh, looks like to say to you that uh, maybe these objects are from different categories. So here you group all these objects and you uh, rapidly judge uh, that they are from one category and here you judge that they are from different categories uh, even uh, despite their very poor spatial organization so they are not definitely not uh, monolithic uh, textures, they are intermixed te textures or uh, intermixed sets, and, but you are uh, very good at doing that. Uh, and by the way, if I upsplit uh, these uh, images by these, uh, this mean, uh, you can see that they are just uh, random subsets, uh, and if I do it uh, for this, it's a very good uh, separation for a subset of lemons and a subset of leaves. Um, and uh, so it works well uh, physically. Uh, and my idea is that the visual system can do similar work uh, for uh, individual features that are distributed uh, wide. Uh, maybe uniformly, or at least without a big gap between uh, values, uh, it is more likely to be represented as a single ensemble or a single distribution with a single peak, uh, with the mean, uh, with the super mean uh, characterizing the whole set very well. And in this case, uh, where you have a gap between values, it is unlikely that it is represented as a single distribution, uh, single peak distribution it is rather represented by two or more peaks, uh, and uh, uh, each uh, can be diagnosed, diagnostic for every category. And I call this property segmentability, uh, and uh, this uh, sort of distribution is called non-segmentable. Uh, because uh, at least without attending to object by object, you are unable to say um, to uh, discriminate uh, the categories of objects, and you are likely to say that they are all the same. Um, and, uh, this one uh, is second one. Um, so this is the theory, and now a few pieces of evidence. Uh, uh, we did a lot of experiments uh, to, to test this idea. Uh, I'm not going to tell about all of them, but maybe uh, the most uh, most interesting. Uh, and um, again, so let's start. Uh, so first is uh, the first test is a test of uh, the segmentability based on uh, one simple feature and this will be orientation of, of lines 
Uh, and we tested it in a uh, uh, task, a famous one that is called Visual Search. Um, and um, <coughs> yeah, this is the paper that, uh, where we published it with my uh, former uh, student, Marie Gorevich. Um, and uh, so, what do we know about Visual Search? Uh, visual Search is a task when you are presented with a bunch of items and uh, you are asked to find um, a single item, which is usually called target. Uh, this target can uh, have uh, very well defined uh, properties uh, by the instruction, uh, like I can say find uh, right, to, uh, right tilted line. It is a well defined target or uh, uh, it can be um, just a singleton uh, not that definite, I can just say, uh, find that oddly oriented line. It can be uh, right oriented or it can be left oriented, you don't know in advance, but it, it is a unique element. Uh, if it is present, then you uh, press uh, yes, that if, if it is absent, press no. Um, and all the rest of the items are usually called distractors. Um, and uh, it is also known, very well known from the visual search literature that um, one important determinant of the efficiency in the visual search task uh, on how uh, easily you can find uh, the item uh, is the heterogeneity uh, of distractors. So uh, here you can see the examples of homogeneous distractors and uh, so they're just physically the same. And in this case, uh, the target uh, is very uh, easily to see. Uh, it's called pop-out. And the distribution here is like that, uh, the physical histogram uh, of the distractors uh, and the target. Uh, so, so, like this, uh, middle orientation, vertical, or like that, uh, opposite direction. Um, and uh, uh, in heterogeneous conditions, you, you can, I think, you can just see it. It is much more difficult to see a target, especially if you don't know its orientation in advance. So, it is uh, much less visible. Um, so, this is the target here. And um, this is the target here, and this is the target here. It is less visible, definitely. Uh, and uh, structure orientations are um, heterogeneous. Uh, but for uh, people studying uh, visual search or perceptual organization, uh, the uh, difference between this and this in general is boring. And, uh, we all know that and it was tested and confirmed many times. Uh, what we did, uh, so this, these were just our baseline conditions. Uh, uh, we predicted that it would be very easy to find. Um, and uh, critically, we tested the difference uh, between these three uh, types of displays. So if you look at uh, histograms, you will see that uh, we used the fixed range uh, of orientations between uh, vertical, let's say, 0 degrees and uh, 45 degrees uh, to either side from, uh, from 0 uh, and the distractor is always uh, the opposite orientation. Um, so, in terms of uh, the range and uh, the distance from uh, um, from the Smith structure to the target, they are also the same. And what we uh, manipulated uh, was uh, the step of transition between uh, the extremes. So here you can see that we used only uh, two, let's say, extreme values. Uh, only extremely left and vertical. Um, and here we added one uh, in between them, but the distance was still rather big. Uh, 
22.5 degrees, because this is 45 degrees. Uh, so something in the middle. Uh, so we increase heterogeneity of, uh, of this um, uh, display and the visual search literature predicts that if you increase heterogeneity, visual search should become more difficult. And here we are uh, totally uh, heterogeneous. A lot of uh, values inserted in between these extremes with very uh, short step between neighbors and uh, we call this uh, we call this condition distinct this condition um, sharp sharp transition and this one uh, was smooth transition um, and so yes uh, this is predicted to be uh, very easy here, heterogeneity increases, and this predicts that each of these searches should become uh, more and more difficult. Um, yeah, so this is easier, this is harder. And we tested, uh, we measured reaction time, which is the standard measure in visual search experiments. Um, and uh, these are the plots for condition when target was present, uh, so uh, if there is an only oriented line, uh, you press uh, yes, and uh, these are reaction times as functions of um, the number of distractors. Uh, we also know that if your uh, search is very easy, uh, then this line should be rather flat because it doesn't matter uh, how many distractors you have, uh, you find the target immediately. Uh, and this is what we call pop-out. Uh, and for a more difficult search, uh, the difficult pattern is reaction time function uh, slightly increases, or maybe not slightly, but uh, rather steeply increases, uh, because you know, need to uh, inspect uh, more and more items before you um, determine whether the target is there. Um, and, uh, so these are homogeneous conditions, and uh, it is uh, very predictable, very easy, uh, quite fast reaction time. Uh, well, actually not super fast for this task, but uh, it is also um, predictable because uh, there were a mixture of, uh, of display. And, uh, uh, you cannot set the strategy very well. Um, and uh, the heterogeneous conditions are slower and steeper, and uh, this is also predictable. And now let's look at uh, the difference. So this is the distinct condition, only two types of distractors, and we predicted that uh, it should be easier, uh, well, the easiest among all uh, distinct, uh, among all heterogeneous displays. And it looks like that it is uh, easier indeed. Reaction time is lower, uh, and uh, well, the function is uh, moderately uh, steep. It is almost flat, especially in the target present condition. Yeah, it, it looks like uh, steeper in target absent. Uh, so it looks like a serial search. Uh, and sharp transition, uh, it was more heterogeneous, and indeed, uh, the reaction uh, time is, yes, heterogeneity increases, and reaction time uh, is uh, lower, and again, it is reasonable. Now, what is your prediction for the uh, smooth, is, uh, the most heterogeneous condition? So, smooth transition of what? Of orientations, uh, like, like this. So you have uh, this sort of distribution, very smooth position, and uh, it looks like that. A lot of uh, differently oriented, uh, slightly deviating uh, from each other. Uh, and what would you predict here? I would predict that it would be easier. Why do we predict that? Because uh, in uh, smooth transition, in, uh, in case of smooth transition, uh, the average uh, uh, this 
abstracter would uh, look more. Yeah, they, they, they are actually very average clothes because they, um, uh, there are no big gap uh, at uh, any point of the distribution. And uh, uh, so this is exactly what we uh, obtained. So it was uh, uh, easier search. Uh, and uh, so this, uh, this is. Uh, Quite a beautiful result, um, and uh, no no single concept in the visual search literature predicts uh, this particular result. Uh, this non-linear um, or non-monotonic uh, relation between heterogeneity and uh, visual search difficulty. Uh, so the explanation for that uh, is. Uh, Yes, so, so this is what we predicted, uh, and this uh, is what uh, turned out to be true in our experiment. Uh, the ran of difficulty, uh, and you can see that the smooth position is uh, easier than distinct and sharp. Uh, and we can explain it uh, by segmentability. Uh, so here you can see uh, that non target for detectors are a single, a very narrow group. Uh, in, uh, here we can see two such groups. Here we probably have three such groups. And you need to inspect group by group, rejecting them serially, and it is uh, not very easy. Uh, and these are segmentable. And in this case, there is nothing semantical there. The transition is so smooth uh, that the visual system globally is unable to discriminate between uh, any uh, orientations uh, and uh, there is no um, definite categorical, categorical boundary between these groups. So, it's how it works. Um, let me skip this study uh, because it is, uh, I, I think, I'm slightly uh, out of time and uh, I'm uh, going to tell about uh, another one that is all, also published already. Uh, so uh, we just tested, uh, I, uh, I just told about uh, this segmentation based on a single feature like orientation. And this is an example of a different study when we used a combination of uh, two uh, features or features in two different dimensions, uh, whether you can do that uh, or not. Uh, this is our paper in uh, Cognition, uh, recently published, and uh, we, we run four experiments there. I'm not going to tell about all four. Uh, but just to illustrate what, what we did. Uh, do you see letter here? Yes. Which one? H. It is letter H. Uh, how, how do you do that? <laughs> how, how do you know? Yeah, do you see it uh, very easy? Yeah. Uh, or probably it is not very visible and you maybe, maybe you do something, some effort uh, for that. Or you see just immediately. I assume it after it was mentioned. Uh, after it was named. Uh, ah, okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, sort of top-down guidance, I think. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, you can see it. Uh, it is uh, better seen here, because uh, here you have only one uh, uh, feature difference, uh, just the average, well, not just average, but just orientation. Uh, uh, steep here, flat here, uh, very easy. Uh, here it is more difficult because uh, they are intermixed with the lines of same steep and shallow orientations, but uh, they are also different in their length. So this is a conjunction, uh, sort of conjunction uh, discrimination, uh, but it is still doable. Uh, do you sell it here? Yeah. 
Uh, try to guess. S. 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 Or S. K. K. Or what else? It's a symbol. S. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so what is the difference between these two examples? Difference is segmentability. Uh, one dimension uh, here, you can see that both uh, length and orientations are uh, very different. Very long lines and very uh, short lines uh, combined with very uh, steep and very flat lines. And here, uh, can you tell me what, which one is segmentable? Uh, orientation. Yeah. It's okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you can see uh, that uh, orientations are segmentable, very uh, steep and very uh, flat, but the length uh, is not segmentable. Uh, there are a lot of different lengths from very short to very, um, very steep, uh, very long, sorry, uh, and it is uh, much harder. So we tested uh, how this conjunction segmentability can be used for um, segmentation and actually uh, this demonstration uh, already shows uh, what we came in the result. Uh, so we tested uh, length and orientations as segmentability cues in uh, four possible combinations uh, and uh, in, in a boring psychophysical task like uh, border discrimination between uh, texture, textures uh, um, so these are examples uh, not letters but just to say whether the boundary uh, between two halves of these displays are vertical or horizontal so these are horizontal, and you see, again, uh, like in H case, you see uh, that this is quite easy. If you uh, say, if you see uh, far, you probably don't see these uh, short lines, and for you this task is, is just a single feature uh, discrimination. Uh, but it is not true, because uh, the lines are actually there. Uh, both segmentable and only orientation is segmentable, or length is segmentable, or uh, none of them are segmentable. So here you can probably see nothing. Uh, it is a very difficult task, and our participants were really bad at that. Um, we measured some psychophysical uh, stuff like deep prime uh, sensitivity index. Uh, so just in brief, uh, the greater this value, uh, the better. Um, without explaining what uh, the prime actually is. Uh, and you see here that it is almost, what well, we tested it in uh, different stimulus durations with mass, uh, like psychophysicists do. Uh, and we found that uh, discrimination was very, very poor. Uh, and, and uh, actually does not benefit from prolonged uh, duration. Um, and uh, so uh, any of uh, segmentability combination is efficient, uh, but uh, both uh, dimension is segmentable. Uh, so here you can see that uh, the benefit uh, increases very quickly. Um, within uh, one to 200 millisecond uh, window, which is really very uh, fast for visual processing. Uh, well, not, not super fast, but uh, sufficiently fast. And uh, it does not increase uh, with additional time. So it looks like that it is quite fast, um, a global process um, of uh, segmentation. Um, and here we just tested uh, as, as an additional baseline condition uh, whether they do this task uh, well enough without uh, conjunction, uh, but just as feature task. And we found that actually when you add uh, the non-segmentability, which is uh, even within a single dimension, which is uh, physically just variance, 
uh, because uh, you uh, add a lot of uh, transition steps. Uh, then it really decreases your performance, uh, which uh, probably in part uh, explains why you um, uh, why you are bad at discrimination, uh, even if uh, one uh, dimension is segmentable enough uh, to um, tell a part of the difference uh, between our uh, between the textures. Mm, I will not explain that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, are you ready to listen to me? Maybe uh, about seven more minutes. Uh, this is the totally new, uh, totally new stuff. Uh, I'm trying to explain it uh, for the first time ever. Uh, it's a new idea, and it was inspired by a uh, talk by my uh, Israeli colleague Shaul Dostein. Um, two months ago uh, at one conference. Uh, and actually, he suggested uh, the original idea, and uh, I tried to elaborate it uh, a little. Uh, and uh, I, would, I, I can say that uh, it is definitely uh, part of his, um, uh, his idea. So uh, how can this machinery work? and uh, uh, how can our visual system do that uh, and what is the possible, nearly plausible um, way to compute uh, such things as um, ensemble statistics and uh, to categorize them based on the properties of the stimulus. Um, are you familiar with the, the very basic concept from um, neural uh, coding, uh, like um, uh, like uh, sorry population code? Uh, who is not familiar? Okay, basically this idea that when you are when you present a stimulus to uh, at, at some place at uh, the visual field, and if you record responses of uh, single neurons in the visual cortex, uh, you uh, can eventually find um, uh, a place uh, if, if you if you place your stimulus there, for example, an oriented line. Uh, and you start to record um, uh, the uh, firing rate of the, the neuron, uh, if it falls into the receptive field of this neuron, uh, and uh, this uh, neuron uh, somehow likes uh, this, uh, so the neur uh, neurons, uh, let's say, uh, prefer particular feature values like uh, certain orientation, uh, so a neuron can be responsive, uh, uh, mostly responsive to a 75 degree line in a certain location, uh, for example a neuron in the primary visual cortex, uh, V1 neuron. And you can also find another neuron that will be responsive, uh, better responsive to uh, uh, maybe a similar orientation like 70 degrees. Uh, but it also responds to 75 degrees, but lower, uh, the firing rate is lower. So if you uh, show a single line with 75 degrees, uh, then you uh, actually uh, can find that not a single neuron, but a population of uh, neurons will respond to that orientation, but with different intensities. Uh, and this is called a population code. And uh, the neuron with the uh, highest firing rate uh, is the one that exactly codes this orientation. Um, now we try to uh, elaborate uh, this idea. Uh, I try uh, based on uh, Shaul's ideas. So uh, let's imagine that uh, uh, you have a stimulus like that. Four oriented lines with orientations like that. They look very similar, uh, and just, mm, they can be represented. Uh, their population, uh, uh, there can be populations. I, um, um, for simplification, I uh, show them as these uh, circles. 
so each circle uh, is a population responding to a single orientation, uh, and these are uh, these Gaussian curves are so-called uh, tuning curves, uh, and uh, the, uh, the whole set of tuning curves is uh, described the population response of these neurons. So they, these are two curves uh, corresponding to each of the presented orientations. They are very close uh, in the uh, orientation space, but they are, uh, in fact, uh, they uh, are located differently because lines are also uh, uh, different locations. But uh, in, in uh, low level, in the low level of visual hierarchy, uh, these population, uh, populations are separated, but in the higher level of uh, the visual hierarchy, the uh, very fundamental property is that um, cells in higher um, fields of uh, the visual cortex, like say uh, V4 and maybe later like uh, IT, um, uh, they they have uh, quite uh, quite big receptive fields, which means that they uh, pull signals from uh, many separate locations from below. Uh, and now let's imagine that uh, these uh, big receptive field uh, neurons are also selective in terms of, uh, say, orientations. And we can say that, uh, for example, this neuron uh, is very responsive to uh, this orientation, so uh, this neural population will contribute uh, to its activation uh, most, but uh, it, it is also responsive to this orientation, but lower, it is the principle of population coding, um, and, uh, but due to large receptive fields, uh, each uh, higher level neurons accepts signals from uh, several uh, lower level populations. And um, so uh, here I show uh, the weights uh, depending on the uh, neural pre preference. And you can see here that uh, I multiply by, by two because there are uh, two populations for each features. And for simplification, uh, the weights are distributed not in uh, not exactly in a Gaussian fashion, but just a sort of uh, linear. Uh, but it doesn't matter; just a model, uh, just a simplified uh, model. And so you can see that if they pull signals from these neural populations, then they uh, will be uh, the outputs will be distributed in the same single peak fashion. And it, it is quite narrow. You see uh, ten, uh, 10 points here, and 6 points here, and then uh, a huge, quite, quite uh, big decrypt uh, here. So it is uh, a single peak and a uh, narrow range. Now let's increase the variance of this ensemble. So now we see four neural populations uh, responsive to uh, four unique orientations. And now uh, the principle is the same, but here you can see that it is less peaky, uh, first of all. So for example, just compare 10 and 6 versus 8 and 6 and 3, so uh, not that huge difference. And you also see that uh, the variance is bigger, I think doesn't work anymore. Um, yes, I think that, that result. Um, so anyway, uh, you see that it is a uh, more broad uh, distribution. And now let's make them... Oh, it works. It still works. Mm -hmm. But the point doesn't work. Uh, now uh, let's look at two very different orientations uh, here. Uh, and you can see the weights and the outputs, um, and they are... So, you can see that uh, the basic idea is that uh, the uh, peak is not in the middle, right? Uh, the, uh, there are two peaks, uh, and they are uh, 
probably they are somewhere close to extremes. And this is just the model, how it might work. Um, and actually, I would like to collaborate with Shaul on that and to elaborate this model great, and I hope to do so. Um, so, yes, this is uh, just the uh, plausible model. We didn't test it in single neurons or like that. Uh, maybe worth uh, testing uh, if we can have access to uh, animals and to physiologists that, that can do that. Um, but anyway, um, just a list of uh, other projects of our lab uh, that we are doing on ensemble some statistics. Uh, so very, very different questions. Really interested in that, uh, and uh, there is there are a lot of um, works in progress. All right, let's see. Thank you for attention. And my lab that uh, that uh, does great job on, on these projects. <laughs> now I'm ready to uh, answer your questions and to discuss this. I ask just a clarification question. So, uh, this model you proposed, that's just a theoretical model that has never been tested even on animals? Uh, it has not been tested. Why, of course, uh, the series uh, for animals, or let's say the series of new? Yeah, yes, this, this exact, uh, exact model is uh, uh, more than a month old. We, we, we don't have uh, very, um, uh, so, so uh, I don't think that people uh, did a lot of nearly uh, ground work uh, for that. So we're trying, uh, we, I mean uh, community, uh, ensemble community, to test that. And uh, um, actually, I'm very inspired by these uh, very few works. They are mostly fMRI works, uh, not single cells. Uh, well, I know probably only one single cell uh, work, uh, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, exactly about uh, this concept of, of segmentability. It is on uh, the perception of motion in uh, macaques. Uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, that can be true. This model can be true. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, nobody tested it uh, between, say, layers, uh, low level, uh, like B1 versus B4. Yeah. It's still a question, but we didn't understand what is this uh, number of multiplication. Uh, low one or uh, multiplication by two. Ah, it, it uh, means that uh, you actually uh, duplicate the number of populations because there are uh, two exactly these orientations. So uh, two, uh, let's say, thirty degree populations, and there are two uh, eight degrees degree populations. That's why. For that, then uh, then the response is normalized. So it actually doesn't matter uh, how many uh, lines are presented in the absolute terms. Uh, it, it just normalized uh, to uh, define the peak. So the absolute height of of uh, this final distribution um, is normalized. Yes. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one, there was a slide with lemons and leaves, uh, and I thought, what if we present uh, uh, two different categories with the same color? Does it mean that we couldn't categorize them, or we will think that it is the one category? Yeah, if, uh, if uh, there is no other diagnostic uh, dimension, like, uh, so, here you can see that uh, lemons and leaves are different not only in color. 
but to be honest, they are also different in shapes. Uh, so if uh, the distribution of shapes uh, is still segmentable, then you are able to discriminate uh, between that. But uh, I think, yes, that in, in uh, your real world perception, uh, uh, objects with uh, different properties, uh, objects of different categories, uh, are redundant in terms of uh, dimensions that provide segmentability. Uh, if uh, the lemons and leaves are uh, very different in colors. They are also different in, in shape, and they're also they may be also different in in size. Uh, in this case, maybe not uh, so different, but uh, uh, fruits uh, and, uh, and maybe other uh, stuff. They can be also different in size, so like that. It is, it's, a, it's a sort of visual heuristic, uh, let's say, like that. Uh, for, it is um, maybe a, a, like the physical world um, uh, works statistically. Uh, it is uh, unlikely that, uh, at least uh, if we mean uh, the natural world, uh, it is unlikely that objects uh, from the same category and that their and their features are distributed uh, in uh, other way than a single peak, than, than normally distributed. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, uh, is it possible to explain uh, with segmentability uh, search asymmetry? Search asymmetry? Uh, okay, now I should explain search asymmetry. Uh, okay, this is... Oh, we don't have any, any marker. No? Um, okay, so <laughs> symmetry is uh, uh, visual search demonstration. Uh, it is a, a case that is an interesting phenomenon from uh, visual search literature uh, that if you uh, look for a target item, uh, that uh, has um, uh, an ad additional feature among destructors uh, without that feature. Okay, I'll, I'll just draw it. Yeah. This is the most classical demonstration of visual search asymmetry. Uh, so, the target here is letter Q among O's, and it is very easy to see. Regardless of the number of distractors, the visual search will be very efficient. If I do something like that, a symmetrical uh, task, uh, the search pattern will be asymmetrical. Uh, and if I measure reaction time as a function of the number of structures, it will be uh, much steeper. So you uh, spend more time uh, dwelling on uh, each of these cues. So uh, such a symmetry is, uh, shows that it is easier to find a target with uh, an additional feature among the structures without this feature then vice versa then, to find a target without a feature among features, uh, among structures with that feature. Um, so, uh, your question was whether we can explain uh, visual search asymmetry with segmentability. I think uh, it's, it's um, not an easy question uh, in terms uh, that probably I don't uh, know the exact relation between um, so anyway uh, I think it uh, segmentability contributes uh, to uh, things like the pop-out effect um, in terms of that if your destructors are distributed like that and the target is like this, then your search will be very difficult. But uh, the 
And if, if it is like this, then the search will be much easier. Yeah, and you assume that the first line is, uh, represent, uh, the first line represents the first picture, right? Mm. Uh, no, the problem is that it is uh, very difficult to quantify uh, the, uh, which stimulus uh, uh, is um, well, where is the transi transition between uh, the object having a feature or uh, having no feature? It is something very discreet uh, in my mind. Uh, so you, you can say either this is a cue uh, or this is a not cue. No transition can be uh, can be made. Uh, maybe something like uh, say factors uh, with the uh, uh, transition length of, uh, of this uh, line and the target is like that then it is segmentable and uh, it will be still efficient uh, and if uh, it differs just slightly in length then it is not segmentable I don't know this is not an obvious um, any other questions? Hmm? Uh, do you see any application of your work in uh, uh, object recognition uh, in uh, computer vision? Um, maybe. Uh, do you think the answer is uh, simple? Your... Maybe. I don't know. Uh, I. I didn't think about it too much. Uh, probably yes. Well, people are trying to create uh, algorithms seeing like humans. Then maybe uh, it's, it's a good point to think about these ensemble statistics and these semantability. <laughs> Okay, cool, and uh, thank you for your attention, thank you for coming. Uh, Brilliant. That's it.